I've written more love songs to Manchester than I have to any individual person, and it's a place of genuine pride. I'm very interested in people and, and, and you know, and the coming together of people. Yeah. So the city is the embodiment of that, isn't it? And if it rains all day, call on you, call on me, like I used to. I started coming into the city centre when I was 12. I used to busk. I used to busk on a Saturday. Uh, it actually became my main income for a little while. And when you were busking, you, you took bus 135? That's right. The, the, the 135 is the bus I got to school. It's the bus that took me into Manchester. So uh, the song's called Great Expectations. I always introduce it the same way. A marriage that took place on the 135, on the top deck of the 135 bus. And I always say, a marriage so secret that to this day, the bride doesn't know it took place. <laughs> <laughs> and it's just a very, very sharp memory of realising I was in love with a girl called Elizabeth Fletcher. Your first love? Yes. Uh, and it was on the top deck of a bus. I love Manchester, yeah. It's small enough for you to feel part of, uh, but it's big enough to realise your ambitions and your dreams. Okay. And the children have such beautiful singing voices. You even write about kids in Manchester, I mean, with lippy kids. Yeah, at the time it was... Oh, God. David Cameron's government, um, he, he was going on... A hug a hoodie was, was the phrase. And it was this, um, it was this kind of anti-ASBO culture thing he was trying to... It was really patronising, really stupid, rather than addressing the issues of poverty yeah. and, and the collapse of the education and the health system. Um, he was like hug a hoodie. It was just, yeah, it was appalling. Uh, and, you know, the right-wing press in this country loves picking on teenagers. Um, and it wasn't... It was around the time that the riots happened. There was huge riots all over the country. Um, and there was an outpouring of anger and, you know, throw away the key kind of mentality. And it was like nobody was kind of saying, these kids are not afraid to steal things and go to prison because their life's already a fucking prison, mm -hmm. you know? And it's like, let's address why, why they are like that in the first place. And so I was writing a song addressing those kind of root fears, you know, of, of, of being afraid of a group of teenagers, yeah. which we all are. Lippy kids on the corner again Lippy kids on the corner begin Settling like crows And I never perfected that simian stroll Cigarettes and it was everything there. Do they know those days are golden? Build a rocket boys. Build a rocket boys. Came down 
changes every time I come back. We want to be in that lake. Every time I come back, and uh, there's, a, there's a new building, and I always think, nobody asked me, but it's changing all around Blueprint. There's all these big buildings springing up around the studio. It's good that the studio doesn't have to move. first album we made, we made it in here. Well, we made a bunch of videos as well. And let me show you the first thing I did when we moved okay. in. This is the first thing I did. The elbow memorial corkscrew. Do not remove, and nobody has. It's still there. An awful lot of wine been drunk in this room. This is, um, this is the working list for um, leaders of the free world, I think. Yeah, so this was 2004, yeah, maybe? Yeah. We've been here ever since. So how many albums is that? We've done seven, eight albums here? I don't know what Never Swear is. Uh, Picky Buggers on it, The Stops Made It, Mexican Standoff did. Station Approach was the first song we wrote in this room, and you can hear the room all over it. Years I picked some things up. One of the things was Elbow is notoriously slow in the studio. Yeah. Be everything to me well, the longer you take over a record in our experience, the better it is. Uh. Yeah. And actually, our biggest record, the fourth one, um, uh, The Seldom Seen Kid, that was about three and a half years. And back then as well, it was like we used to come in at sort of 11 ish and we'd work through till five. Yeah. And then everyone would go home for the tea, put the kids to bed, come back about half seven and we'd stay through till midnight. And we'd do that five days a week. Yeah. Maybe this is slow because they're in the proximity of that little bar over there. Yeah, <laughs> the Eagle, known, known locally as the Lamp Oil. <laughs> um, when we moved in here, that was a very dangerous pub. Oh, yeah? yeah, and because of its proximity to the dual carriageway, to the road, armed robbery would happen a couple of times a year, and it was full of villains, criminals. Uh, and whenever a journalist would come, we'd take him in there to scare them. <laughs> Criminals are really, really old sulfurers that have been using the place for years and years. And now it runs comedy and it has a, a venue. Uh, and I've spent many hours of my life here. <laughs> hello? Hello, hello? I'll show you my favourite spot. So, given its proximity to Blueprint, where all our equipment is, is stored, 
when we're about to go on tour, yeah. this is generally where we meet. This is where every elbow tour starts and finishes. But it's great. It's a lovely little oasis of, uh, of fun. Look here, some of the lads. Does it help that you have in a band with only friends? Oh, God, yeah. I know plenty of people who are in bands with people who aren't their friends. No. And it's like, ruins it. You might as well have any other job. I sat across the road from Piccadilly Records, where uh, Laura, who still runs the place, who I saw the other day, she took uh, 15 copies of our first EP as Elbow. Mm -hmm. And they'd all been burnt one by one onto CDRs in my manager's office. And it had a black and white photocopied sleeve, but we numbered them, like limited edition, yeah, yeah. you know. <laughs> uh, and I, I sat opposite in the night and day cafe uh, and every couple of hours, I'd go across the road and stick my head in, and she'd go, no, nobody's bought any, like that. And then I came in and she went, we've sold three in the last hour, because it had a review in the local listings magazine, City Life. So she'd sold three. So I went to the call box, because this was pre-mobiles, of course. Mm -hmm. I went to the call box at the end of the bar in the night and day cafe, and I phoned all the members of Elbow and said, we've sold three, <laughs> you know, so it's like, those achievable benchmarks mean that it didn't feel like we were in a wilderness. There was always something to look forward to. And then that you thought, hey, we made it. Uh, I'd say, again, incrementally, but we didn't believe our album was finally going to come out until we, we, we were on tour, we were doing a, um, a little show in Cardiff the day it came out, and we all went to a record shop and looked at it on the shelf mm. and stood there and looked through the sleeve and shook each other's hands. Mm. And that, that was the OK, you know. If nothing else happens, that happened. This is where... This is where the bottle lies Where all the biggest questions meet With little feet stood in the side And this is where Echoes slow to nothing on the tide And where a tiny pair of hands Finds a sea warm piece of glass And sets it as a sapphire in her mind And there she stands I was asking you about these moments that you thought I made it. Yeah. You once got an email by Paul McCartney. Yeah. I'm notorious for not checking my email. Yeah. My manager, Phil, texted me and said, check your email. And I looked and it said, uh, a message from Paul McCartney. I was like, wow. 
Um, and it was an email from Paul saying that he'd been dropping off one of his granddaughters at school and he'd heard us performing Magnificent, she says, um, a, a live version of it on the radio. And, uh, and he said he had to stay in the car, even though he got home, uh, to hear who'd done it. He wanted to hear who'd written the song so that he could drop us a line and tell us how much he loved it. And, I mean, that's, like, amazing. This is where it all began. Magnificent, she says, is one of your songs that's not about Manchester. Yeah, it is, yeah, it's true. <laughs> I was on my honeymoon and talking to my wife about beachcombing when she was a girl and asking her what was the best thing to find. And she said, worn pieces of glass, like pebbles of glass. Um, and she was telling me all about this. And every morning where we were in Sardinia, you could hear kids playing on the beach in the morning. It was the lovely sound to wake up to. And we were talking about having kids. And then we got this piece of music and I started sort of putting the song together. And then halfway through writing the song, a couple of months later, Rachel found out she was pregnant. Uh, and we were told we were having a little girl. So I finished the song. A world that doesn't even know how much it needs this little girl. It's all going to be magnificent, she says, you know. The sleeve for the album was done with a little girl on it. And then at our 20 week scan, the sonologist pulled this face and pointed to my daughter's penis. <laughs> and we both burst out laughing. <laughs> we both looked at each other, first of all, to see if the other one was OK, but then we burst out laughing. Cheers. <laughs> I lived on this street. This is Great Bridgewater Street. And I lived just down there for nearly 10 years, something like that. And this bar. Its full name is the Temple of Convenience. Yeah. Oh, we're getting people's way a little bit. This was opened by my friend Rayful Conn somewhere in the late 90s. Uh, the council was so perplexed that anybody wanted to convert a public toilet into a bar that they gave him crazily low rent. And I think it's still at this very, very low rent. Um, this is the hole in the neighborhood down which of late I cannot help but fall from the song Grounds for Divorce. I've been working on a cocktail called Grounds for Divorce. Hello, hello. Whoa, 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 whoa. Hello. Polishing a compass that I hold in my sleeve. Yeah. Any drink? Um, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yes, please. Thank you. Do you see that? That's what you want. He knows what I, he knows what I want to drink. Um, I've spent so much time in here that the rumour was I owned it. When I lived on the same street, I'd roll down here in my pyjamas, you know, and if we were eating uh, and we had spare food, I'd bring it down for whoever was working. There's a hole in my neighbourhood down which of late I cannot help but fall. There's a hole I lived right near the temple, and I'd walk to the studio every day across town. And I'd cut the corner by coming through Parsonage Gardens. Um, we were working on the Selvin Scene Kid, and we didn't know what to do with grounds for divorce. Mondays is for drinking to the Selvin Scene Kid. But we had the words, we had the theme, we had this guitar riff, and I was singing on the chorus. Uh, singing along with the riff, but with lyrics. And, you know, you listen back to that, and it's terrible. But I was thinking, how do we make this guitar riff bigger? How do we make it more impactful? And I was walking through town with my music on shuffle, and Give Peace a Chance came on.
and I was struck by... It's such a terrible recording. It's thin and it's pointy, but because there's a lot of voices on it, it's powerful. And because of the message as well, of course. Yeah. But, it, but its power is in how many people are singing rather than sonically. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And I realised that if there was an element of that in the verses to Grounds for Divorce, lots of voices, and that's why, where I came up with the whoa and the hand claps and the community vibe of the verses. And we realised that that gives lots of sonic space for the guitarist to be enormous. And the epiphany you had here. Yeah, Give Peace a Chance came on, like, here. <laughs> and I stood there listening to it for five minutes. It was literally here as I was walking through Parsons Garden. started work on what was to become Seldom Seen Kid. Mm -hmm. And I, I gave the head of A&R, Jim, I gave him a copy of the album at, at the dinner on, on a CD. Mm -hmm. um, he took it back and then the chairman of Universal, David Joseph, gave me a call. And he said, this is a beautiful record and will do you proud. You'll sell more copies of this than anything you've ever done. But... Is there one more song to help us at radio? That's what he said. Yeah. And I said, well, given that the rest of the ten songs have taken three years, <laughs> probably not. <laughs> I, said, I said, but, you know, we've got three weeks before we're mastering, and we'll, I'll give it a go. Riding this wave of euphoria that we were finally going to get this record out, that we had a new record deal, that we had an album that we were proud of. Riding this wave of euphoria, we wrote our most anthemic euphoric song. It's really good, do it it, it bought us all a house. Yeah. Yeah, I, I, I love the thing. It's, it's become like a... <clears throat> it's always the last thing we play, every concert. Because it's the audience's chance to sing. It was done in about three days. And then, of course, it took off. It, 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 it was on everything. It was used on every TV programme, every advert. It was everywhere. <laughs> singing One Day Like This as the athletes came round the track, but they came out here, if the stage is at this end, they came out here, they went all the way round, and then they went into the middle here. So I was actually singing to a very bored-looking volunteer with a big light bulb on her head. <laughs> so I'm pointing at her and singing to her, 
and, and she's, she was literally going... <laughs> the backstage at the Olympics, when we got the information for it, it said that it was a dry backstage. Mm -hmm. And uh, I like to think I'm quite an easygoing, amenable character, but this really got my back up. Well, surely it's up to us whether or not we have a drink. I've never been on stage sober in my life. So he said, you, you can drink after the semi. Uh, that, that's what they're saying. I was like, who are they? <laughs> who are we talking about? So he says, the production team. It's the guys that usually do the so Super Bowl. I was like, fuck the Super Bowl. <laughs> I'm having a drink, work it out. I was really panicking. <laughs> And we ended up sneaking our bar in, in Madness's flight case. <laughs> we had a fully stocked bar in our room, yeah. and it meant everybody, you know, we, me and Pete wandered around with a pint, and it meant everybody was knocking on the door. Brian May was knocking <laughs> on the door, you know. <laughs> Can I get a drink in here, lads? He's like, yeah, come in. Those curtains wide. 